For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Ask someone to quote a Bible verse, any verse, and it may prove difficult, but ask them to quote John 3, 16, and you're in business. It's the perfect verse for a bumper sticker, a plaque on the wall, a sign at a protest march, or I once had a co-worker that had this verse fly across their screen saver. And even our son, Evan, at a young age, could recite this verse forward and I think backward. <laughs> but one day, one day, Evan came to me and he asked, but mom, what about those people who don't believe in God? Will they perish? And what does perish mean anyways? I surmise that Evan had a little agenda behind his inquiry, but at the moment I was scrambling for the right words to respond to him. And in those moments where he was looking for an answer, I have to admit those same questions had crossed my mind too. And I don't remember exactly how I responded. I'm, I'm sure it was profound, but it seemed to satisfy him for the time being, and I let it go at that. So now here I am many years later preaching on a text which alluded to such simplicity in the past, only to find out that this text can be problematic problematic in the face of God's unconditional love for all things. All things. The cosmos. You see, John 3.16 has become a kind of trademark for evangelical Christians, a way to reduce this and simplify the statement of its slogan, which has proved to create division and dangerous activities all within God's kingdom. The verse appears so simple and straightforward, but it's not. In fact, I kind of like to just stop at the part where God so loved the world. But then, then I think about my neighbor, you know, the one who cut down my tree and showed no remorse. You see, I would like to narrow the parameters of God's worldview and be a title holder of God's love. After all, I work hard. I serve in the ministry. I serve the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. I go to church and serve. But the second half of that verse, for God so loved the world, here it is, that God gave his son, his only son, so that, so that, in this way, everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This part of the verse sounds pretty cut and dried, too. And it certainly doesn't include that neighbor of mine. Because he never goes to church or volunteers at the local food pantry, and his political ideals are drastically different than mine. So that's comforting because, you see, now I know my future is secured. Because what about, but what about the person who has never experienced God's love? What about the brokenhearted or the people who have lost everything due to circumstances or a, being a part of a system that has created generational poverty. And what about those who were raised with the concept of a punishing God and, and have given up on the belief of any God? And what, what about people who express 
compassionate love, but in different ways than I do, who don't fit the mold that my Christianity has created. And what about sin? Mine, yours, the church at large. You see, this is where it becomes very problematic for me. Because if I am to grasp what Luther called the gospel in a nutshell, then I need to see God's love in a way that believes God is fundamentally a God of love. And that love, that love is the logic by which the kingdom of God runs. And God's love surpasses everything else. Even justice is the end. Therefore, John 3.16 condenses God's entire plan from the beginning into this tiny nutshell. The good news that Jesus came to proclaim, to die for, and to be resurrected in is out of this bigger-than-life love of God. And if this is the case, what do I do with my neighbor? What do I do with the pain and the suffering of the world? What do I do with my tendencies to judge and condemn others? And I don't know what that looks like for the Putins and Netanyahus and all the empires who maim and kill and trample hundreds of thousands of innocent people. What do we do with evil? John 3.16 is getting a lot more problematic as I go along. But one thing I have come to learn about God's kingdom, ignoring the pain and suffering in this world is to ignore the rest of the story. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son. You see, living in the light of God's love also implies darkness, too. You can't have one without the other. We are reminded of that in the gospel today. We are also reminded that according to John, this judgment thing is not connected to a future time. It's a present reality. John's love found in the cross includes all things. All things. But it also reveals every ugliness in and about us. John's gospel is telling us that now is the judgment time because what happens to love when we don't live by love? It perishes. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light, because what they were doing was not life-giving. Living in the darkness, you see, does not require anything of us. It keeps us and our brokenness in the shadows. But God, however, God will not let the world that he loves perish. He will not let it suffer complete ruin or destruction. And he will not leave me nor you in the darkness and shadows either. The light that hangs on the cross exposes the darkness in me, maybe you. So how... In the world, did this bumper sticker billboard statement of Jesus become so complex? And I can't say for you, but for me, downright disturbing. Because maybe, just maybe, it isn't all about my neighbor. We all experience death and destruction when our words 
and actions and sinfulness don't gel with God's love. The Israelites in the book of Numbers today were given a way out of their so-called darkness. Their grumbling and complaining had finally caught up to them. This time, they are claiming that God has brought them out in the wilderness to die. Out in the wilderness. No food, no water. And, well, they detested what they had. Their repentance, however, is forthcoming but not before they are swarming in poisonous serpents where one bite could cause death. And it did. Help, they said. Help, Moses. Ask God to get rid of these serpents. And God, God in his gracious mercy and infinite love for all things provides a way out. Moses is instructed to build a bronze snake. And if the people are bitten, they look up at the pole with the serpent on it, and they will live a way out. But notice here, God does not take away the snakes. He provides a way out. He does not remove us from the painstaking challenges and the ugliness in the world. But God always offers us that way, that way out. And that is attached to the gift of grace. However, the gift of grace is not always pretty. Living into God's grace demands that we extend it to others. And that is not easy when we are living in an us and them mentality. The gift of grace is hard to follow day in and day out as we navigate our lives in the midst of the pain and suffering and sin. The gift of grace, you see, is exactly that. It's a gift. The gift of grace and the glory of the cross enables us to expose the darkness which keeps us from living fully into the abundance of God's love and love for those we perceive may be out of that circle of love. For God so loved the world. Everything. I thought perhaps uh, this would be where I'd end today. But living in the light, I realize, requires sacrifice. It certainly did for Jesus. But we, but do we live in the light when, <clears throat> but do we live in the light when we, only when we can afford to? When darkness seems miserable and comfortable all at the same time and love our enemies? Well, maybe if everything is taken care of first, and vulnerability? Ooh, only if there's no other choice. See, this kind of self-sacrificing love Jesus offers is frightening at times. No wonder we find ourselves working harder in the shadows of all kinds of stuff that condemns the love God has for creation. Instead, instead of coming to the grace of God, a God who loves the whole world, even my neighbor. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world is not an exclusionary tale. It is a story of love that speaks truth all the way to the cross. It is a kind of love that heals the brokenhearted, is deeply embedded with the children of Gaza, is deeply embedded with victims of war and hatred, and deeply embedded in you and in me. 
So when we find ourselves, and we will and we do, find ourselves mired in fiery serpents and a darkness that seems to overcome, we are given a way out. Because the one whose steadfast love, Samud, makes it possible for us to come to live in truth and come to the light not once, not twice, but to come and come and come and come as you are. This is the Easter story. So, Evan, what happens to those who don't appear to be part of the equation of John 3.16? Will they perish? You know, Evan, I believe in a God who lifts high the cross and who intercedes on behalf of the world's pain and suffering and mine. You see, Evan, the redeeming and transformative power of God was prepared for you and for me and for all of us beforehand to be the way of life. By the way, there was a hidden agenda behind Evan's inquiry. It was about the family down the street. He saw so much pain and suffering in this family as they dealt with a devastating disease of not one but two of their children. And, and there was a lot of argument and fighting and, and, and they weren't always fun, nice kids to play with. But he saw that and his heart ached. Don't tell me young kids don't get it because they do. And, well, I was shocked as anyone to see the family show up in church the following Sunday. But I, did I catch a glimpse of moisture? Yeah, in my son's eyes, in mine too. So, Evan, Paula, Scar, Bill, First Lutheran, and the church at large, and all the nations, Lift high the cross that all may be healed. For God so loves the world. Amen.